All right, you ready to finish up 2.8? Let's go. So we, I'm, I hate you so, so much. So, so, so annoying. Uh, anaerobic respiration application. Um, this is used in baking and a lot of different things, okay? So what you do is you take glucose, you do this in a factory, and that gets changed into pyruvate. And then that gets used by, these are all different kinds of bacteria, Aspergillus, Lactobacillus, Saccharomyces, and they make different products. Uh, this this Aspergillus makes lactic acid, makes soy sauce, which I love. I love soy sauce. So salty, though. This Lactobacillus uh, makes lactic acid, uh, used in cheese and yogurt. And the acid level, any kind of strong tasting cheese, usually it's because of the acid level, along with other uh, cheese is really a a fascinating topic in biology, uh, microbiology in itself. Um, things like beer, uh, ethanol is produced, and carbon dioxide. You also have the wine industry and the bread industry relying on these anaerobic processes to make the product. So hundreds of millions of dollars a year use uh, this basic process. Very cool. Now, a lot of you may have wondered, um, you know, I know I as a kid was always interested in anaerobic versus aerobic exercise, sprinting versus long distance, and how the muscles work. So really, we want to dig into a little bit how uh, that affects, um, affects uh, muscles working. So sometimes you need anaerobic respiration. Uh, weight lifting and sprinting, things that need short, quick bursts of power. Um, uh, it's much faster, much faster yield. Um, happens much faster, uh, but um, sorry, I misread that. Uh, let me go back and uh, erase this because I misread it as being aerobic. See how easy it is? So aerobic respiration, you know, slow and easy, that's a greater yield. You get more ATP for the amount, for basically for one molecule glucose, you get 36 molecules ATP. And for aerobic respiration, it's two. So you, if I ask you, you want $36 or $2? You'd probably say you'd take 36. But the thing is, if I ask you, if I give you $2 now, or $36 two weeks in the future, you might take that $2 now if you really need that money. Anyway, that's what your body's doing. If you need it fast, it's gonna go anaerobic, but if you can wait for it, it's gonna say aerobic. Um, but anaerobic respiration uh, can supply ATP a lot faster. It doesn't need to go through the steps in the mitochondria, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, skip all that, get right to the payout. Um, so maximal power, like weightlifting and sprinting, um, and uh, product in humans is lactate, and there's a limit to how the concentrations your body can tolerate. Uh, and this is really when you look about training. So if you're training athletically for something, like the people doing the LA Marathon or any kind of athletics you're basically getting your body accustomed to that pain of that muscle burning. Um, and you just get used to it. And that's part of it. You're always making about the same amount of lactate, but you're just getting more accustomed to it. It bothers you less. Um, somebody who doesn't train feels that, doesn't do the training, feels the burning and it really affects them. And then they stop and they can't go as hard or as fast. Um, but afterwards, that lactate must be broken down and you need oxygen to do that and that means gives that's called an oxygen debt and that's something you hear about if you did a lot of anaerobic activity it means you got a lot of lactate and you gotta break it down which means in the future you need that oxygen to uh, break it down but it does get broken down and it can be regenerated and reused um, in the future so that's kind of a side, cool sidebar and how it happens, uh, how it works with athletics. 
So we need to talk about a rest parameter. So check out what you see here. It's a sealed system. So it's all sealed up. And this is sealed at the top end and this is sealed at the bottom end. And basically any gas that either enters or leaves this chamber is going to make this little mark go up or down. It's going to either suck the gas and that's going to make this go up or it's going to push. And um, so this is used here to measure, basically measure the gas levels. Basically, are they increasing? Is there more gas in there or decreasing? And the reason you have the syringe here, because you need to carefully, to set it all up, you need to get this at a certain spot, this level in this uh, capillary tube here. So you'll use this plunger to get it set up correctly. Now we won't be using these. We uh, will just use a direct sensor. This is kind of an older style way to do it. But IB wants you to uh, understand how it works. So you stick your specimen in here. Animal tissue, like we talked about, we're not going to use animals. We're going to use plant tissue um, or like yeast, which isn't a plant. It's a fungus. You can put like a seed in there that's germinating and measure how much oxygen it's eating or using up in respiration or yeast, which is what we'll be using. In one of these types of respirometers, though, you're going to have potassium hydroxide. That's an alkali. And what it does, it absorbs CO2. Because if you're giving CO2 and taking out oxygen, you're not really seeing a difference in the gases. So the idea is you are absorbing all the CO2. So that is negated. You're controlling for that. So if you're using oxygen, it should reduce the pressure in there because you're taking out a gas. And that should suck this, um, this level of water here in this capillary tube up. If you are making gas, it would push this down. But typically in these experiments, it's going to make it move up. And that's what is being measured. And that's what we'll look at in this right here. This is like an experiment that was done. They tried out six different temperatures and they say they ran it um, and then they kind of did three readings three readings of that of that capillary tube that would be a, a reading that they did right here and they then you get an average because you know any one reading of an instrument might be off so getting several readings will help increase improve the accuracy so what you need to do, you need to be able to make a graph from information like this. So I'm going to take you through that, and then you're going to do it on your paper. So the first thing you want to do is um, think about what our x and y axis is going to be. And usually whatever you set up, so in this case, you see how they set up the temperatures, you know, 5 through 30. That's usually on the x axis, your temperatures. And whatever you're measuring, which here which is the movement of the fluid is up here. And it's going to be, ah, oh, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> All right, not so bad. Movement of fluid. Oh, I did better than I thought. Or maybe you disagree. But, and then millimeters. Oops. Eh, millimeters um, per minute, negative one, which, which means it's basically you could write it like this millimeters over millimeters per minute and again that's how many this is all marked off in millimeters here so how many millimeters per minute is it moving and what you want to do is average those readings so 2.0 1.5 and 2 and i went ahead and did that and since we're only down to the tenths i'm just going to round it to the tenths so that's 1.8 uh, these three is 2.7 these three are 3.8, and then we have 5.5, yes, that's what it is, 7.3, and 10.7. Now, what kind of graph should we make? Should we do a bar graph? Should we do a line graph? Should we do a pie graph? For this, um, it does recommend a bar graph. We're trying different temperatures. Um, you could do a line graph, though, um, because 
these temperatures, it makes better sense if they're in order. Okay, if they're, um, you, you don't, you're not going to really put the 20 in front of the 5, in front of the, in front of the, uh, the 20 in front of the 10, or the 30 in front of the 15, or the 15 after the 20. So let's go ahead and make, we're going to make a, uh, a line graph. So this is going to be this point here. Let's see, I need, I need six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So this will be, we'll just say that's zero. And this will be five, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30. And this will be temperature. degrees Celsius. And along the X, we'll start this one at zero, and we need to go to 11 and a half. So I think I, if we skip two, we should be able to do it. This is one, that's two millimeters. That's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We barely made it. Okay, so let's go ahead and graph that first one at five um, five degrees. It's one point eight, so that would be right here. Gosh, I keep making that menu show up right there. Then two point seven. <laughs> so I I got one day figure out why that happens. Seriously, what? It's messing up my life. Oh, I really, oh man, this is, I'm sorry about that. Oh my gosh. Okay, I, I don't know what I did, but that one stuck. It's going to get lucky. 3.8. 3.8 is here. Uh, 5.5 is here. 7.3. There. Oh, no. Hold on. Let me get it back. Okay, coming back. Let's see. Uh, 25 is 7.5. And then 10.7. Right there. Let's leave it. I want you. Okay. So, um, that's basically the graph. And what you can do is uh, set up, is like link them together. Try to think, in this case, it'd be better to take a straight edge and then kind of estimating a line. I'm sorry, that's not straight <laughs> at all. But you do a better job. What well, I want to show you a second are error bars. Hopefully, this doesn't mess up with me. Um, but you can show the minimum and maximum. Usually you use standard deviation, but min max is fine. So this first one, the, the max is two. So you could put a little mark there. The minimum is 1.5. Put a mark right there. You can join that with a straight line down. And IB wants to see you understand the uncertainty levels. Uh, and this is one way to do that. Here for 10, it's three is the top. Take a little line there. And uh and then the, the lowest is 2.5, which is here. And then connect them. Still don't know what goes on with that. And then here is 4 is the maximum. And 3.5 is the minimum. And then I'm going to connect them together like that. And then 26. Struggle with that all year, but this is really bad today. And then five. It's 
pretty straight there, not too shabby. And then um, eight, like that, 6.5, like that. See, this one has a big, look at that range. That's probably the least reliable one. See how big that is between minimum and maximum? And then the last one is uh, 11 and a half, which we don't have on there, but it'd be about right here. There, and then a 9.5. That's pretty wide too. So those last two ones are pretty, that should be straight. Those are pretty unreliable. So, uh, but go ahead and make that graph. Um, you can do something similar to what I did, and thank you.